comes, here he comes, here he comes. Come on, come on, eat it, got him! Yeah! Welcome, Bone Fishing 101. I've got some tips for you. Bone fish can be incredibly spooky, but when you do things right, they play very fair. Uh, they tend to eat your fly, uh, unlike a, a permit, for instance, which can be incredibly discriminating and make you question your The other seat. thing that you're going to see with bone fish is you're not always going to be necessarily looking for the fish itself, but you might be looking for a, a subtle wave of water going against the grain. Like a, like a very subtle bow and ask your guide how far they estimate that is and, and it'll be a completely arbitrary number they'll say 30 feet well there you go there's your baseline whatever you have out happens to be 30 feet so when they tell you it's 30 look at another angle what you'll really see is more of like the absence of sand and it'll look like a ghost just moving across the sand fish are hard to spot right now in this sun i had to stop moving and just let these fish come at me until the mirage became real. What a cool... I'd say 15% of the casts I make are going to be long casts. 100% need to be accurate. Alright, that was just fabulous. I got to give my guide Chewy credit for that one, man. He spotted that fish. And uh, I was just a, a couple of fish that moved out. He was like 10 o'clock and, and I, I held my false cast in the air. And he just said, further left, further left, further left. I kept my false cast moving that way. And then he said, right there. And, and I go, yep. And then I saw the fish and I was able to make another minor adjustment. I didn't go blind, but he really talked me into the fish. And uh, the other thing is, not every cast has to be long. That was a 40 footer. 100% of casts have to be accurate. And you guys can practice that at home before your trip. I think it's imperative. You spend time on the rod, you learn to throw a nice tight loop. And when the bonefish fishing gets really good, like it has been the last little bit, you feel like you can catch fish at will. If you can get the fly there, these fish cooperate and they're gonna eat all of the bonefish. They are just pure muscle. They take off at 100 miles an hour. It's so exciting, especially when you're sight casting to these fish. Let's let them go and try to find another one. Hey, it's Joe at Red's Fly Shop here. I'm gonna give you some Bonefish 101 today. I want your first Bonefish fishing trip to just be just out of this world successful. So, I'm gonna go through some basic tips. First off, we're gonna Bonefish fish in beautiful places. You can do it either on foot, like I'm doing it right now, or you can do it out of the bow of a flats boat or a panga boat that got us here. Chances are, if you're watching this video, you're gonna be on a guided trip. One of the first tips I have for you in Bonefish fishing is just establishing a good line of communication between you and your guide. Your guide's gonna spot 95% of the fish when you first get started bonefish fishing. Eventually, you're gonna get a little better at it. But one of the first things you wanna do is just establish the clock. We got 12, depending on how you're standing. If we're wade fishing, it's gonna be off of your posture. If you're boat fishing, the clock is gonna operate off the boat. So you wanna make sure and get that clear right off the bat. When the guide spots a fish, they're probably gonna say one o'clock or two o'clock. Now, when he says one o'clock, I would strongly encourage you to make sure you see the fish before you cast. You're gonna lose some opportunities early on, maybe the first couple hours of the first day, but after that, you're gonna be way more successful if you can see that fish on your own and learn to spot that fish. So try to restrain from just blind casting at the guide's, guide's direction. So we say, hey, we got one o'clock, 30 feet. Well, 30 feet can be kind of arbitrary. It could be in meters, it could be feet. So what I recommend is you take out a reasonable length of line, just as much as you can comfortably cast. You don't have to throw 100 feet all the time. You don't even have to throw really 100 feet anytime. So you're gonna throw a length of line, you're gonna ask your guide, how far is that? The guide's gonna say 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, 10 meters, whatever it happens to be. Now you have a bearing to communicate. So now you know that that's 10 meters a line. So we now have the clock established. We have some type of distance established. Now what we're gonna do is we're probably not gonna be able to see the fish at first. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna point my rod and I'm gonna say where? And then the guide can say right, 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 right. And then he could say right there. And now it's gonna take me a moment and if I still can't see it, 
what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on the bottom in front of me and my eyes are gonna scan out like sonar until I see that fish. Now that I've seen the fish, I could make a much more calculated approach and make a good accurate cast to that bonefish. When it comes to seeing bonefish, it's gonna be the, the hardest thing that, that you have to do is seeing the fish. You've got this wave chop like this. We've got a few clouds blowing over. Maybe we even have a little bit of current and the bottom is multicolored. There's a lot of different things happening. So when the boat's moving, you're gonna have some movement kind of going this way like this. And when you're waiting, one simple tip that you have is when you're waiting, you can just stop. Now everything is still. Bonefish are always gonna be on the move. They're gonna be moving slowly along and that really helps you identify what has movement when you stop. In the boat, it can be a little bit more challenging to do that. But what we're looking for is we're looking for a mirage that's moving, there's an absence of the bottom, and that fish is just moving slowly through there. The other thing that winds up happening, and this might sound silly, is when we're in the boat, there's almost kind of this vertigo effect that takes place because we've got all these different elements between the wind chop and this, the sun, the sun angle and the fish moving is just establishing with your guide is the fish facing left or right. It can be really deceiving. And once you know that the fish is facing left or right, if the fish is moving in a consistent line, we'll go ahead and we'll place that fly six to 10 feet out in front of that fish. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, hey, we're moving at uh, 11 o'clock, left to right, 10 meters and I've laid that fly right out in front of that fish. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take a slow strip in just to eliminate slack in the line. I want good connectivity with my fly. That way when I strip it or move it for imitation, the fly actually moves and I'm not stripping against a slack line per se. Now, bonefish, bonefish presentations can vary based on your location. Um, it could be very different in the Pacific like Christmas Island then versus the Bahamas or Cuba or Mexico or something like that. But the universal presentation for bonefish is generally gonna be a short, quick little shrimp-like strip, just like so. And you'll notice my rod tip is very low to the water. You do not wanna strip with that rod tip up. It's sloppy, it creates line hop and a lack of control. I'm gonna have my hands out in front of me. If I believe a strike is imminent, I'm gonna throw right here. I'm, I've eliminated the slack, I'm waiting. The guide is probably gonna give me a little bit of direction as I'm learning. And then I'm gonna begin stripping in short little strips like that. Uh, if I can see the fish, it's so exciting when they peel out and you can see that they're now following your fly. And this is a good tip for setting the hook. If the fish accelerates and tips down and then, and then essentially stalls, that means it ate your fly typically. It accelerates to chase the fly, it attacks down like that to grab your fly right out of the sand, and then it stalls for a second. At that point, we may not even wait to feel the fish to set the hook. I may be stripping, stripping, stripping. The fish accelerates, it noses down, and I'm gonna go ahead and give it a nice jab like so, and that's gonna be my strip set. Do not trout set. Do not lift your rod tip up, it doesn't work. You're gonna fail. Uh, you're gonna hear the guy groan and go, oh, trout set. So we wanna make sure that we keep our rod tip down, a nice strip set. Typically bonefish are gonna do a 180 and turn out and go the other way, in which case I'm gonna feed my line out through my line hand, keeping my hand away from my rod to help eliminate that line, getting around the fighting butt just like that. Now when it comes to casting, all saltwater casting, the better caster you are, the more success you're gonna have and the less frustrated you're gonna be. And you'll still get a little frustrated from time to time. This is a good challenge. The main thing with saltwater casting is you can practice this at home. Just learning how to drive a good quick cast, be able to pick up from right here and track down a moving fish and be able to shoot the line right out there. Moving your fly around the flat, the faster you can pick that line up and shoot it out again, the more success you're gonna have. And just one simple tip other than just practicing well in advance is just understanding that your back cast is critical. Most often your guides are gonna have you casting with the wind. Of course, you're gonna have to cast against the wind sometimes too. 
but when I'm casting with a tailwind like I have been recently as we've walked down this flat, I need to make sure I pick that rod up and I really drive it back aggressively so that my fly shoots out into the wind behind me, gets nice and tight, and then it's just a mere flick to go ahead and send that fly forward. The other thing about casting for bonefish too is we want to make sure that we're setting the fly down soft. They're low on the food chain out here, okay? So we want to make sure we, we set the fly down soft because they're going to be fearful of predators. It could be, uh, it could be an osprey, it could be uh, a, a shark, it could be a barracuda, a giant trevally. There are lots of things out there trying to get the bonefish. And when there's splashes or anything outside of their normal comfort zone, you're going to spray bonefish across the flat. So when it comes to setting the fly down soft, we want to make sure that we decelerate if we can on our presentation cast, let that fly shoot out, flutter right at the end of the line, and settle down as softly as we possibly can at the end of the cast. Alright, let's talk basic tackle essentials for bonefish. Um, I don't want to get too technical here. Um, Flies are primarily going to be shrimp style patterns with bead chain eyes. Um, there's a link in the video description to a huge collection of bonefish flies. The, the, biggest, the, the biggest impact your fly has is going to be the weight of the fly. Sometimes you're going to be fishing for bonefish in a little bit deeper water with some tidal current. You're going to need heavier flies for that. And you're going to fish either shrimp patterns or crab patterns. I have caught bonefish on some small streamer patterns, but bonefish primarily prey on crustaceans, so be thinking shrimp patterns and crabs in a variety of weight from little bead chain eyes to lead eyes that are going to sink fast and buck the currents to get you down there right on the bottom. As far as rod selection goes, I can't, I can't emphasize enough, saltwater specific rods just cast into the wind better. They recover better by being able to pick up a line and shoot it right back into the water. They're more durable so we can take them for a week in this environment and even if this fly hits my rod tip a couple times, salt water rods just seem to be a little bit tougher than an all water rod. The, the primary difference is salt water rods, they, they're not designed to mend, they're not designed to roll cast, they're designed to generate line speed into the wind for challenging casting situations. Um, I prefer an eight weight myself, but anything in the seven to nine weight range is probably appropriate. Eight being a really nice, happy medium there. Seven weights are, they're fun, they're exciting, but there's potential that this rod may need to do some heavy lifting for other species like uh, small tarpon or barracuda. And I just find an eight weight to just be a great choice for anything in the bonefish flats. As far as fly lines go, bonefish fly lines, they're designed to lay the fly out very delicately and soft as bonefish are living in just shin deep water and can be very spooky. So a bonefish taper line has a longer head of more delicate taper. It can be a little bit more difficult to cast an aggressive fast action saltwater rod with a light taper if you're a beginner, in which case overlining your rod or choosing a line that is a little bit cap more caster friendly could be a good choice uh, for you in that situation. Bonefish run like crazy, they're pure muscle. They, they'll they take you right into your backing like that. Um, if, if you think you're gonna be serious about saltwater fishing and you want your equipment to last years and years and years, be thinking about a really good, sturdy saltwater reel. Something you can trust, something you're not gonna go use once or twice, let it sit for a couple of years and let the, just the, the voracious corrosion of saltwater eat that reel alive from the inside out. I've seen lots of reels fail and uh, they always seem to surprise you when they're doing that. As far as other tackle items, our tippet is going to be, or our leader system is going to be, uh, a minimum of a nine foot fluorocarbon leader. There are bonefish specific leaders. You can check out the link in the video description. And these leaders are designed to turn over flies in the wind, lay them down with enough delicacy that we can still fool the fish but the, the taper lasts way down into the fly here because we are gonna be casting in demanding situations. Uh, I use pure fluorocarbon leaders. Uh, I, I use one about every two days on a trip like this. And then the knots that we're gonna tie are gonna be loop knots like that right there to give that fly a little bit of extra action. That's a non-slip mono loop that I have tied in the end there. Uh, the terminal tippet diameter for me, I tend to go a little bit heavy to start 
with 16 pound test. This rod may be cast at permit uh, as well or some jack creval or other species that I encounter. So I tend to favor stronger tippet and I might have a few bonefish refuse and not eat the fly, in which case I can then downsize to maybe 12 pound test. But me personally, I'm starting at either 16 or 20 pound test depending on whether there's coral present. Uh, whether there's coral present. Get yourself a good waterproof pack. Salt water is just, it leaves a, a real sticky coating and you want to be able to rinse your gear off and wipe it off. Uh, as far as wading shoes and things go, uh, depending on whether you're in coral and, and, and rocky conditions or coastline type conditions, you may want a solid lace-up boot, something that's going to give you some firm ankle support. Uh, right now, I've just got some zip it style booties uh, from sims let's go ahead and show those off there and uh that those are great they're easy to slip on in the sand flats they're really great when you're doing a mix of boat fishing and wade fishing as well that you can just slip those zip it ones on zip them up and get going uh, lastly just a few more tips on equipment is good sunglasses or paramount i think i'd rather forget my rod than forget my sunglasses it's absolutely critical uh, that you're able to see um, and I like um, I like just the best glasses you can afford I, I don't even really want to pick a brand because I just think it's more important just to emphasize a good set of fresh glasses that don't have lenses scratched up fresh polarization before you go on a fishing trip and then having uh, a hat with a dark bill underneath like so and then using a hood or a buff all the way up over the backs of your glasses to keep backlight off your lenses uh, helps dramatically as well and then one more little kind of like pro tip is when the guide sees a fish and if it's a low light conditions later in the day um, one little tip is these glasses the polarization changes depending on how you tilt your head and one of the guys on the trip just gave me this tip but it, it's amazing how much it works but if you're having trouble seeing the fish the guide's pointing out sometimes tilting your head a little bit changes the polarization pretty dramatically against that glare and that can be just just enough to give you a bearing on that fish so that you can make a much more accurate cast that's certainly not everything you need to know about catching bonefish or fishing for bonefish but i think these tips are going to be an immense benefit to you if you're going on your first trip and you want to try to make the most out of your experience on the flats